money was being diverted from health care, education, about to pay off the, the loans. There were a lot of people that did benefit from these crises. Everything has been done to keep this game going. Are there economic hitmen from powerful organizations that get poor countries to sign up for infrastructures that they don't necessarily need and take up loans that they essentially cannot repay in order to make profit? After I studied economics, I worked as a stock trader. I traded stocks and bonds for a few years. I would read company research and study the price movement in the market. It sounds boring, but I loved it. I actually still do. In my family, everyone is good with numbers, but I left the trading floor to become an actor. And because of my previous job in the market, I came across a book titled Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins, and I was shocked. These people were not discussing buying and selling stocks or companies. It is actually about buying and selling entire economies. The writer talked about economic hitmen who coordinate with bigger nations to exploit and devour poorer countries. Professional people whose job is to deceive countries and extort them with trillions of dollars. Is this a colonial tactic? To strip countries of their resources and political will? A country that needs to build or renew its infrastructure will need capital. It also needs the expertise, technology, equipment, and all of that. Developing countries likely will import some or all of this from another country. In order to pay for the imports, they will take a loan. It seems simple and straightforward, right? Fortunately, I can talk to someone who did this job. His name is John Perkins. I want to ask him about his previous job. I was recruited by a big international consulting firm called Charles T. Main, which, which has been since been bought, so the name no longer is out there. My, my title was chief economist. And I had uh, as many as 50 people working for me. My job really was to identify countries that had resources our corporations wanted, like oil, <laughs> like in the Middle East, oil. And then to arrange for a huge loan uh, to that country from the World Bank or the IMF or one of the sister organizations. But the money would not actually go to the country itself. The country would collateralize the loan uh, with its resource, uh, but the money would go directly to our own corporations, big engineering companies like Bechtel and Halliburton and Brown and Root, and my own company would get a piece of the action to build infrastructure projects in the country. Things like power plants and industrial parks and highways things that benefited a few rich people in those countries, as well as making huge profits for our own corporations. For a long time, I thought I was doing the right thing, as many people in that business do. But over time, I began to see that those, those statistics, GDP, gross domestic product, and other statistics are very skewed to the rich. And so the rich were getting rich, but the poor were getting poorer because money was being diverted from health care, education, and other social services, and, and just basic foods and supplies uh, to pay off the, the loans. I should mention one other thing, that the presidents of these countries knew that if they accepted the loans, they were putting their countries deep into debt, but they were also, they were gonna get wealthy off this. Their families were gonna benefit because they own the businesses, they own the industries, they own the things that were helped by electricity and so forth. But there was another incentive for them, and that was that the, what we call jackals were in the background. And these are CIA assets, usually, who overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. John Perkins is not the only one that spoke about this. Many others say that developing countries which are in heavy debt 
may go through coups and assassinations as a result of not wanting to play by these rules. And they say that these institutions and companies that lend countries have thousands of employees, and some jobs there are to manufacture and manage such crises. I reached Vincent Bevins, author of The Jakarta Method, a book which discusses the American intervention and collusion during the mass killings of Indonesians by their government in the 60s. I am sure he has something to say about this. Hi, Vincent. Are there figures like economic hitmen, really? Ones that force abusive contracts on nations and countries? What I can say is that in the second half of the 20th century, it was absolutely true that a lot of countries in the global south, countries that used to be part of something called the Third World Movement, ended up saddled with a lot of debt, which became unsustainable. And the fact that they were saddled with debt and the fact that the debt became unsustainable has, to, has a lot to do with institutions and actors um, based in the global north. So are these institutions and actors from the north economic hitmen? Who is benefiting from this? There were a lot of people that did benefit from these crises, whether or not they were uh, financial actors or key players in international banks. I think what's important is that it absolutely happened and it benefited a small group of rich people in the global north. And do you think that these practices are still in place today? It's now fairly well recognized that the prescriptions the IMF uh, was going around the world and handing out to indebted in poor countries were often very destructive. The IMF has even gone back on a lot of what it said in the past was the right medicine for a country that quote unquote had problems, uh, even if those problems might have been generated by the, the system itself. But at the time, nobody was questioning this. And, and the fact that the IMF 20, 30 years later says, oops, uh, we, you know, we, we actually might have ruined uh, half the world's countries doesn't change the fact that we're still on the path today that was created by those actions generations ago. From an economic perspective, and even capitalistic one, wouldn't you say that keeping everybody healthy with good purchase power to engage in the global economy is better for the whole world than crippling them by loans that they cannot repay? This is the paradox at the, I think, the heart of liberal ideology, right? Because one would believe based on the tenets of economics um, practiced in the English-speaking world, and one would believe based on the ideals of liberalism in general that it would be better for everyone to make sure the countries in the global south are growing just as fast and as robustly as are any other country. But what we have seen is that did not happen over the last 70 years, and countries in the global north are still doing just fine. In the middle of so much data, someone could say, well, these countries and regimes accepted the deal and committed willingly. Nobody forced them. I will ask this question to the American economist, Richard D. Wolff. Hi, Professor Wolff. How are you? Very good. I'm very glad to be here. What can you tell me about the so-called economic hitmen and corporations or institutions that strangle countries' economies? First of all, it happens all the time. It is nothing new. It is not rare. It is common. So somebody from a powerful corporation goes and... ...will sometimes connect to a local equivalent of himself and cut a deal and say, look, I'm going to get paid $10 million for getting this done. I will give you $2 million if you become my local eyes and ears to help me work this out. Forgive me if I will sound naive. Isn't the country receiving this loan participating willingly in this terrible deal? Happens all the time. People from third world countries can get into that because they understand this game and they get the job because they say, I know better about the details of local politics. And by the way, it, it often fails. Don't imagine it's all so smooth. Sometimes one of these people will get drunk and say the wrong thing to the wrong person. Sometimes a local official will have a change of heart and want out of this situation. Sometimes people who take a portion then get blackmailed by somebody else who knows they did that and now they have to get out of that. 
International credit is a very complicated, sneaky, personal business that can have all the different twists and turns that you can imagine. Sometimes we have whistleblowers, people who speak up out of principle. This could change things, actually, right? The only answer I can give you is that everything has been done imaginable to keep this game going. And one of the most important things is that when you get caught, either nothing is done or one or two individuals are punished, but you never change the basic system. And let me be for a moment the advocate of the banker who initiates this. That banker knows that if he can work three or four big deals, one in Ecuador, one in Mali, and one in Malaysia, he will be promoted to the president of the bank. That's how you succeed in the bank. They don't care how you do it. You shouldn't embarrass the bank, of course, but your job is to get that loan done. So if you don't, because you are honest or you have scruples, you are shooting yourself in the foot. You are destroying your own career. So often you will, if you know these people, they will tell you they have no choice. And that it's important for people to understand. This is a systemic problem. After I left my job as a trader, I started a career in acting. And there were times when I didn't know when the next check would be coming. I understand how it is to be in a difficult financial situation and how this makes you vulnerable. Imagine when the entire economy of a state is placed on the betting table. This can put them in a vulnerable position, unable to negotiate anything but their survival. I know some questions are painful to ask, but I still will ask them. 